Influence lines. Influence lines are diagrams that show a load's influence on one point along the beam. This is not to be confused with shear and moment diagrams. Shear and moment diagrams show one load scenarios influence over all points along a beam. Now let's say we have Mario and Luigi as our supports for this beam that is holding a mushroom unit load. Right now the mushroom is on the Mario side, which means Mario is experiencing 100% effect of the mushroom load or 100% of the influence of the load. Now, if we move this to the middle of our beam, Mario and Luigi are now sharing the load of the mushroom, which means Mario is experiencing half the influence of the mushroom, and Luigi is experiencing half the influence of the mushroom. If I continue the left to right movement of the mushroom, It's now on Luigi's side where he will be experiencing 100% of the influence and Mario would be experiencing zero influence from that mushroom load. Let's say we have the system that's pinned at A and we have a roller at B and we want to find the influence line for the internal shear and moment at point C. Starting with a free body diagram where I've sectioned at C, I see I have four unknowns and this is not determinate. Yes, I realize there's not a load on here yet, but that's the influence line that we're gonna mess with in a minute. So I cannot start with free body diagram AC. I need to start with free body diagram AB. Starting with my unit load on the far left, I can sum moments about B and solve for AY. So we have our unit load, which is 1, acting at a distance of 15, minus AY, acting at a distance of 12. My reaction AY is then equal to 1.25. So that means I can now come over here and put in 1.25 on my free body diagram AC, and I can sum for forces in the Y direction and I will have minus 1 plus 1.25 minus shear at C. Remember from solids our positive sign convention where shear acts down on a left section, normal acts in tension, and moment has compression in the top. We need to have this positive sign convention for our influence line diagrams to be the right way. We find that shear at C is equal to positive 0 0.25. Using that same free body diagram, I can sum for moments about point C. And I have 1 times 9 minus 1.25 times 6 plus the moment at C. And my moment at C is going to equal to minus 1.5. So when the load is at the far left, my internal shear at C has one quarter the influence of the load, so it's carrying one quarter of the load, and the moment is experiencing one and a half times the load. Let's move our load. When our load is at A, I will still sum my moments about B but this time our load is moved closer. One times 12 minus AY times 12, which means AY is experiencing 100% of the load, one. So now if I sum for my forces in the Y direction, I will have minus one plus AY that is now equal to one minus shear at C. Shear at C is now equal to zero. It is feeling no effects from that load at all when the load is acting over the pin. Summing moments about C. One times six minus one times six plus moment at C. 
moment at C will also experience zero influence. Let's move the unit load to where C is located mid-span of AB. With the unit load now acting mid-span, or six feet from B, on our free body diagram AC, I've got two options. One option is to draw the unit load to the left of the section, and the other is to draw it to the right. Does that change AY? No, because we're talking about millimeters, thousandths and thousandths of a millimeter here, a theoretical difference, okay? So AY is not going to change, but shear C may. So we'll come back to free body diagram AC in a minute. So let's solve for AY when the unit load is over C. Again, summing moments about B, I have one times six feet now minus AY times 12, and we find that AY will be carrying half of that unit load. On my free body diagram AC, AY is now 0.5. So if I sum for forces in the y direction, I will have minus one plus 0 0.5 minus shear at C, which means shear at C is going to equal to a negative 0 0.5. If I sum for moments about point C, I will have AY 0 0.5 acting at 6 feet from C clockwise plus my moment at C. So my moment at C will now equal to 3 times the influence of that unit load. Now here's the fun part. If I take this unit load and move it to just to the right of C, it's no longer going to show up on free body diagram AC, but AY's influence is still there. So how does that change my work? It actually doesn't change my moment at all because that unit load was already acting at zero distance from point C. It is, however, going to change our force in the Y direction, where we now have only 0 0.5 minus shear at C. Shear at C is equal to a positive 0.5. So our magnitude jumps by one whole unit from negative 0.5 to 0.5, and it changes sign when we go from one side of the section to the other. Let's move our unit load one more time to over point B. If I sum for my moments about B, I have AY, times 12, which means AY is going to have zero influence from that load. Plugging that into our free body diagram AC, and summing for our forces in the Y direction, shear C will also have zero influence when the load is over point B. Summing moments about C, we find that moment C is not influenced at all by the unit load when it is the unit load is over B. If I were to plot my influence lines, I would see that I'd start at 2.5 because we had a positive shear influence. It comes down to zero. When the unit load is at A, It continues down to a negative 0 0.5 when the influence, or the influence load is just to the left of C. When it moves to just to the right of C, our influence jumps up to a positive 0.5 where it then comes back down to zero when the load is over B. The moment, however, starts at a negative 1.5 influence, where it crosses 0 at A, continues up to 3 at C, and then comes back down to 0 at B.
Now, why do all that work for influence lines? So we can get to critical load. So what we've done using a unit load to create our influence lines is make a unitless value that we can then multiply loads to and come up with a critical worst case scenario. Point loads should be applied over the largest value. Distributed loads should be applied and multiplied to an area. Dead loads are going to be applied over the entire system. Live loads we can just apply over the worst case scenario or a positive scenario or a negative scenario, whatever it is that we're designing for. Live loads can also be split up. Let's say we are given this beam that has a pin at B and a roller at A. We're also told that the dead load for the system is 400 pounds per foot, the live load is 1.5 kilopounds per foot, and there's a point load that is 8 kilopounds. Find the largest positive vertical reaction for pin B. We're going to start by solving for the influence line of pin B. To do that, we're going to apply a point load at pin B, at roller A, and at the free end. There's nothing that's going to cause a change in our support between those points, so we can just leave it at these three points. Setting up our ordinate system, we're going to have a vertical reaction, BY, and we're going to have a horizontal reaction, BS. BX. We are also going to have a vertical reaction, AY. Now we learned from the previous example that when the load is at 1, BY is equal to 1, and at location 2, AY is going to take on all the load, so BY will equal to 0. So we need to solve for BY when the load is at point 3. I'm going to sum my moments about A. We will have 0 is equal to minus by times 20 minus 1 times 15. And we find that by is a negative 0.75. Plotting that on our diagram, we're going to start up here at 1, come down here to 0, and end at negative 0.75. So here is how BY is influenced as a load moves across our system. Now, to use critical load, we're going to be taking this information and applying the load accordingly to make a worst case scenario for BY. And it's asking specifically for the positive vertical reaction, because we can also get a negative vertical reaction at B on this right side over here. Dead load is going to be applied over the entire system no matter what. My live load, I can apply it anywhere that I want. So since I'm trying to get the maximum positive reaction, I'm only going to apply it over this first 20 feet. So here is my live load. Same with the point load. I can apply the point load anywhere I want for the worst case scenario. So the most positive magnitude influence that the live load is going to have is right over B itself. So there is my point load live load. Now that I know where everything is, I can find my maximum positive BY reaction using my influence line and my loads. So starting with the dead load, positive BY max is going to equal to 0 0.4 kilopounds per foot, and I'm going to multiply that to the area. So I have a positive area of base 20 feet times height unit 1, and that's a triangle, so it's 1 half, and then minus base 15 feet, height 0 0.75, and it is also a triangle. 
So there's how much the dead load influences BY. The live load is only over the positive area, so that's going to be my 1.5 kilopound per foot, and it is acting over one half of base times height for that one. The point load is going to be the full point load, eight kilopounds, and the maximum value influencing BY is one. Solving out this problem, I find that my positive maximum vertical reaction BY is 24.75 kilopounds acting up. So can we do influence line for trusses? Absolutely. So here is my truss, and I'm going to start with a whole free body diagram, AX, AY, and EY. And instead of looking for connectors, because that would work exactly like a beam, the beam in this case would just be the truss, we're actually looking for influence on a member. So in this case, member BG. So it seems to me if I do a section here, I can go to the left and get my reaction AY from the load, and then I can sum for forces in the Y direction and get my internal force BG, and I can work my way across the truss and get my influence line for that member. When I apply the unit load at A, we're going to have a similar experience that we did to the beams, that pin AY is taking up all the load. So force BG is going to equal to zero. Moving the unit load to H and summing moments about E. I find that AY is equal to 0 0.75 and I find that force BG is equal to 0 0.4. Four, three, six, and three significant digits. Now you may ask yourself, what happens if I put it at B instead of H? Well, summing moments about E, AY is the same. So coming over here, summing forces in the Y direction, and it does not change anything with force BG. Moving our unit load along to joint G, summing moments about E, we find that AY is equal to 0 0.5. And coming to our sectioned free body diagram, our force BG, summing forces in the Y direction, comes out to a negative 0 0.872. Moving our unit load to joint F, we find AY is 0.25 and force BG solves to a negative 0 0.436. You're seeing some symmetry pop up, which makes sense. Our last location for the unit load is joint E and we find that AY is equal to zero, which makes force BG also equal to zero. Plotting the results for force BG, we start and end at zero with our reactions taking all of the influence of the unit load. When we move five meters, it goes up to 0 0.436. When we move another five meters, it drops all the way down here to 0 0.872 in the negative, and then again, 0 0.436, and back up to zero. I didn't ask for it in the original problem, but what about force GH? 
That's the horizontal member that's just above this diagonal member, force BG. Well, as the unit load moves from left to right, does AY change? No, it doesn't. So to get our force GH isolated on the same section AA, we don't even need a new section, we would sum our moments about B. And that would get us force GH. So when the unit load is at A, we find that force GH is equal to zero. When the unit load is at H, force GH is equal to negative 1.07. When the unit load is at 2A, it doesn't change. When the unit load moves over another five meters to be on uh, joint G, force GH is negative 0 0.714 in magnitude. When we move to location three, I mean, I'm sorry, location four, force GH is a negative 0 0.357. And last, when the unit load is at five, which is joint E, force GH is equal to zero. Again, plotting our results, we start and end at zero. When our load is over H, we're down here at our furthest point at negative 1.07, and then we slowly come back up until we get to zero. What about this symmetric truss? What is the influence line for member CG? We are gonna find that as we move the load from A to H to G to F, and then it to E, that force CG remains a zero force member. And as a matter of fact, it still remains a zero force member at location six, and seven. The only time that CG will ever carry a load is at point eight, load point eight, when it's actually loaded itself. Which means our influence line diagram is going to look like this with it specified at eight. That makes member CG a secondary member because it'll only carry a load if the load is acting at um, the correct even side of its joints. I was gonna say at one of its joints, but even when it's acting at G, it's not a zero force member. So that's what makes it a secondary member. However, back here, when we were doing GH and BG, they have forces no matter where the loads are. Uh, smaller ones, of course, where there's the connectors, but they, they experience forces, so that makes them primary members. So we've got a special case here with member CG.